Good evening, everybody. I see that people start to join us for our evening webinar, How to Overcome the Impact of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, please use your chat box at the bottom of the screen and announce who you are and from where you are so that we can get an idea from both demographic and geographic um, representation this evening. We already have 27 people online, so that's great. Um, great joining rate. So use your chat box. Hello, Yuanita Cup from Queenstown. Yuanita Cup is one of our serial serious um, attendees of our webinars. And we are welcome to have her there. Kirsten from Cape Town, welcome. Um, Katerina, hello everybody. Dr. Elise Powell from Verenigen, hello Elise. Uh, Gail Davids, good evening. Right, Rafilio from Bloemfontein. Amina joining from Durban. Welcome, Amina. Uh, Elizabeth Powell, oh, I said she's from Vereniging, yes. Uh, Perrin Richardson, Dr. Luzozi from Centurion, Ayanda from Gauteng, Kenneth from Botswana, welcome. Um, Perrin, all the way from Grahamstown, welcome. It's great to have you on board. So, we, Nita Kati from Cape Town, welcome. It's wonderful to have so many people from different places all over Southern Africa. Nalezi from Gauteng, that's wonderful. And you will not be disappointed. To be sung from Clarkstorp, um, welcome, Tom. Right, I'm going to give another minute or so before we start. A Wonka from Eastern Cape, wonderful, welcome. Really well representation or good representation from all over the country. That's always good to see. It's always good to see how our members participate and is hungry for new information and ways and learn from experts. So with that, I'm going to start. Um, Chumani, hello Chumani, welcome online. Right, so I want to start the session with saying that I'm Almi Castleman from Golden Key International Honor Society. I'm the director for Southern Africa. With me online, I have Dr. Enki Pitswe. And um, I first want to start with a video clip before I introduce him and before I allow him to say a word. So let's start that video clip, please. So it's been two weeks since the birth of the quintuplets from Phosphorus in Johannesburg. But the five bundles of joy are still the talk of the town. Weighing just over a kilogram each at birth, the Butelezi siblings made history as they were recorded as the fifth set of quints to be born since 1960. To tell us more, we're joined in studio by the man and the doctor who delivered the babies, Dr. Mueng. Pitswe. Did I get it right, Dr. Pitswe? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Got it right? Yeah. I d one name I do not want to get wrong is yours, because if I ever come <laughs> to deliver babies, yeah. which it's not going to happen, yeah. and I happen to have more than one in there, I think you're the man that I want to come to. <laughs> Five babies at once. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Because at the end of the day, um, it, it was what we have been reporting is that the mother wasn't expecting five and neither were you. You were yeah. expecting three triplets. Mm, sort of. I, I remember she came and saw us in, in February of, 19, of this year, yes. <laughs> 2018. Yes. Uh, she had a, what we call an, an, an infertility issue, secondary infertility. She has a child. She wanted another child and she was just taking too long so she needed help. And we put her onto uh, drugs. Uh, what we call ovulation-inducing drugs. 
<laughs> so those ones help to produce more eggs so that she can fall pregnant. So the desire is to have one child. As a side effect, we can have more than one child. And that side effect really speaks to the genetic predisposition of the mother. So some will have two, some three, some four, some five. Yeah. So a month after the drugs, we she missed a period. We did the ultrasound scan and it showed four babies. So we, okay. we worked so on four. So you were four. expecting four babies? We were expecting okay. four from the start. And then as we went on, we, we, we could only see three. And we assumed that we had lost the other one, these things happen. And we said to the mother, listen, we think we have three to work with, and that's what we want to work with until we get to where we go. Yeah. And, and that was, so it was a triplet story for a long time. Wow. Yeah. Then the day came. Well, then just day tell came. me the date again. What date are we talking about here? We're, we're the 6th of uh, September. So this was the 6th of September. The 6th of September. She comes in to have yeah. the babies now. Yeah. And, and obviously it's through cesarean. But, but I think the much more important story is what happened prior. Remember these multiple pregnancies come with huge problems intrauterine so we had to we had to mitigate against the risks that come with carrying three four five babies yeah. as we thought the preterm labors the majority of the uh, pregnancies prior had been preterm labor so they delivered before time yes and so we we knew this was a risk and we had to work with it and i think the disadvantage that the other quintuplets had prior to this one was that we weren't pharmaceutically advanced as we are now to help keep the babies inside for longer. For how longer. Long was, how many weeks was she when she? She was 30 she, weeks. So she was 30 weeks. Yeah, and that's which good. Is, that's very good. That's this good. Is, this okay. is in fact one of the longest quintuplet pregnancies in the whole world. Wow. And and that's because we have drugs like uh, you know Dufastone that we give patients steroids, magnesium sulfate that not only keep the babies inside but make the baby's lungs mature inside so that if they come out before time they can breathe better than they would have otherwise had they not had the steroids. So I think the advanced technology technologically, scientific, pharmaceutical over the last 20, 30 years is what really, really helped us get lucky with this pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. So she comes in and uh, so, so she, she was, I, I, I'm more interested in what happened in that theater. I know, but we, we sort of said, you know, <laughs> get, us, get, get us to 30 weeks. Get us to 30 weeks. So we uh, got get to, us 30 to 31 weeks. weeks. Get us to 32 weeks. And I think at 30 weeks, she said, I can't, can't anymore. Do. Why can you it's imagine now, please? It's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, carrying yeah. one baby, I yeah, yeah, was yeah. ready at, I, I think I was ready at 30 weeks to say, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm ready now can we bring, can we yeah. bring him or her out yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, she's got five yeah. babies inside her so she came in for an elective caesar and and we planned for three so everybody was ready for three we had three cots yeah and we went one two now the good thing was that as soon as the first baby was born they whisked it away into the neonatal so the three cots were now three again and then the second one came tripped <laughs> and up and so the three were empty again and then yeah. just after the third one the anesthetist said to me you know i'm just about to put a drug that makes the uterus control can you make sure there's no baby then? I said, no, we only have three. But anyway, I'll remove the placenta and there's a baby's head. Ah. So we pop baby number four Be and I think everybody said, oh, whew. well, just make sure there's no number five. And then we thought there was a big joke. We went in, there was number five. No way. So at this stage, we thought there could be number six. And we started really panicking and looking. And luckily for us, it was all there was. What was mom's reaction to all of this? Uh, she was under spinal. Okay. And she was subdued. She was sort of sleepy. So, Did she, so she was not aware. Yeah, she was aware. She was aware that the numbers were going up and piling up. <laughs> the father was the one who was wide awake. No, the father was he and, actually. And he, so he didn't faint. Uh, he kind of he had to sit down. He yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, uh, he he's sitting sit there and he's like, okay, yeah. coffees. No, we um, all had to sit down nappies, because <laughs> baby grows. Yeah. What am I going to do here? My, yeah. I, I got to take on another two jobs. Yeah. That's it. So which one was the last one to be born? The, the girl. Boy? The boy so, was the first one. So to the be boy born. is the first one. And so he was a 1.4 kilogram. He was the only boy. He was the only boy. And all the quintuplets in this country have been four girls than one boy from 1960. Oh, wow. So that's been uh, the way it is. Yeah. There's no theory behind that, is there? No, it's just, just the it way it is. It just happened. is the way it just is. Just the way it is, yeah. So when we're saying that the numbers of 1960, is that in South Africa? In this country. Because you were telling me one in 42 million is the, are the chances yeah. of you having... That's correct. That's how rare this thing that's is. That's how rare it that's is. That's how rare it is. But you know... We, we've had over the last three years, remember we had 1960 in East London, we had 1980 in Campton Park, and then there was a huge gap. Yeah. And in 2013, there were the quintuplets in, in Pretoria, the Mapakole twins. Three of them couldn't make it past five days. Okay. In, in, in January of 2014, the Zondi queens were born in East Pingo in Devon. Four of them couldn't make it yeah. past the first uh, seven days. So these ones are the first quintuplets in this country, and in fact, the third in the world 
to live for seven to 14 days as a collective. The very first ones. Ah, uh, and they are doing well. They're doing very well. So they're strong, they're waiting. They are out of the ventilators, they're breathing on their own, they're feeding on their own. Uh, the biggest one was 1.4, the smallest is 1.2. I'm expecting him home by the end of October. They should be two kilograms and ready to go. That is absolutely incredible. Yeah. What a beautiful story. How's mom doing? Because I mean, this she's is doing a great. Thing she's doing great. Her. Yeah, she, as you can expect, it takes for one baby, as you said, it takes you about six weeks to get back to yes. your normal self. Yes. So she's going to take a little longer. The time is still big, as if there's number six wanting to come out. But she's otherwise, you know, doing well. She's out of hospital. She's walking about. She's she's breastfeeding the smallest ones, and we're watching her as we go along. Wow, um, Dr. Inki Moeng Pitswe, what an honor to have you tonight hosting a webinar for us. Um, I did this a bit impromptu. Um, Dr. Inki Pitswe is a very humble person. I'm going to first read to you his CV and then you will understand why I um, thought it's necessary for you to know how important it is that we have him in the webinar for tonight. You will still see that he's still wearing his scrubs because he just possibly exited theater. So it's such a pleasure to have you here, Enki. I'm going to tell you, Dr. Pitsu is a medical practitioner of 20 years. He doesn't mention on his CV that he's actually a gynecologist and obstetrician and a world leader. Um, that's why I played you the YouTube. Um, and he's passionate about social, educational, and rights activists. His greatest passion, therefore, being to impart knowledge and information to empower society, and this gives them the key to lead themselves. And that is the very important clue of why I thought Dr. Henke is so well um, situated and uh, um, well put for this specific webinar. I couldn't have thought of a better person to lead this because you always bring the locus of control back to the internal person. So with that, I'm going to first ask Dr. Enki, before he starts his webinar, Dr. Enki, please share with um, our audience, where were you born and bred? Um, I, was, I was born and bred in, in Phuket. Is a village in Rustenburg, and um, I went to school uh, in a in a primary school called Saron Primary School. It was a Lutheran church primary school, um, and I I I used to walk uh, from my village of Kale to the main village uh, Saron to attend school, um, and after that I went on to uh, Saron. Uh, so I went to the lower primary school. Then I went to the higher primary school. And what's often fascinating for, for me and, and people uh, that I, I, I talk to about my education is that I learned, I spent the first, up to standard five, my education was in Setswana. So I only changed over to English when I go to high school. And it's a, it's a very powerful story for all of us who come from that era because people think learning in English is the most important thing you can do to yourself. But mother tongue education, which a lot of people have not had, uh, has been a huge, huge negative in, in the development of many young Africans. So I did everything in Setswana up until that time. Uh, and then after that, I went to the high school in, in Pugeng. And when I finished with the high school in Pugeng, I, I went over to Pretoria. I did my matric at a high school called, uh, it's a Catholic high school. And when that finished, I went to the University of Natal where I did my medical degree, uh, finished the medical degree, uh, went on to specialize. And when I finished doing that, uh, worked for a bit in this country and then went to Australia for five years and came back into South Africa in 2007. So I've been back in the no. country now for that amount of time. What a powerful story um, to say that it's not about where you were brought up, but it's about what you do with your life and taking control of it. And with that, yeah. I'm going to hand over to you to help us tonight to understand how we can overcome 
the impact of COVID in our personal journeys of development. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. We're very honored to have you here. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. I see my son is one of the panelists. Hello, Sham, how's it? Good. <laughs> so so um, I'm going to, to, as I said to you before, uh, try and talk to this problem in three legs. And the first leg is to try and explain what the impact of the uh, COVID-19 disease is on us, and then try and, and personalize the impact to say on a personal level what the issues are, and then finally speak about overcoming those personal impact stories so that we can move on with our lives. Now, if you can imagine how things work, uh, everything that impacts our lives starts with a personal impact. And um, so the virus is no different. And uh, from a personal impact, you can talk about the local impact of this, whether it's your little town or your home or your village. And then you can talk about the regional impact of the virus, uh, whether it's Eastern Cape or KZN. And then you can go and talk about the national impact, which is a South Africa wide story. And then you can talk about the global nature of the, of the virus and how it impacts us in that sense. So those for me are the, the little mini uh, sort of uh, stories that you can look at if you want to dissect the impact of the virus uh, on our lives. Now, if you then just focus on the personal impact, I've said that you, 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 you present five pillars that as far as I'm concerned are your personal stories. The first one is your mental uh, story how it impacts you mentally. The second one is the material or economic impact. The third one is your social impact. Your fourth one is the physical space impact. And finally, your career impact. So if you look at those as pillars of that leg, you can fully understand that there's just a myriad of ways in which you can be impacted by this. Now, there's an environmental impact away from your person, but that also comes back to you. And what has happened with this story is that all of a sudden, we have a whole lot more bottles of sanitizers to deal with. We have to get rid of them. People are making a billion more gloves than they were, say, six months ago. We have to get rid of those gloves. We also have issues of uh, uh, water usage, where societies that didn't have enough water, have to find water to wash hands and not drink because that's the only way you can deal with this. And then there's all these billions of masks being made in China and everywhere else that we use for once per day and throw away. And where do they go to? They get wasted. And so we create an environmental issue with us trying to solve this uh, pandemic. Let's for a minute get back to the details of how a personal impact story uh, falls out. Now, on a mental basis, depression has become a major issue all over the world in terms of how this virus has impacted us. The anxiety that comes with it is the other part of it. You wake up every morning, you're not sure if you or your loved ones are going to get infected. You're not sure if people are going to die around you. And that whole question mark, is enough to give you fear and anxiety on a daily basis. Now, these are all mental issues that from time to time we have to grapple with. On a material level, uh, many of us have to deal with a reduced income. You know, companies are saying, listen, we, 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 can't, we don't have the money to pay you anymore. So if you, if you still want the same money, we're going to have to upload you. But if you want to stay with us, you have to accept the pay cut. I mean, they've done this to footballers. They've done this to everyone all over the world. So, so the reduced income comes with consequences. You know, the car you used to afford, you can't afford anymore. The house you used to live in, you can't afford anymore, and so on and so on. But the worst case scenario is the loss of jobs. Now, materially, with the loss of jobs comes not only the material loss, but also the psychological angst that says, you know, where am I going to get money to do one, two, three, four, five? So these are the really, really important things under that pillar of material. Socially, we have been isolated. Now, if you've been in solitary, solitary confinement, you understand how that 
can have a negative impact on your day-to-day -day life. The, the loss of the social infrastructure support, you know, the auntie you used to go to to say hello, the friend you used to see to just go and talk about your issues, all that all of a sudden cut away from you, you have nothing to fall back on, and that's a big issue. The cultural restrictions that have come with this, you can go to the funerals, of people you care about. You can go to weddings of people you care about. And you know, where we used to, for example, one of the cultures that we do as Africans is we wash bodies of people that die. You can't do that anymore. So all of these things have got an impact in how we live our lives and how we define living as we move forward. In terms of your physical uh, impact story, uh, physical well being is very important. We all exercise, we all walk. We all do stuff, and all of a sudden, you can't go to the gym anymore. You can't even walk outside. You know, you can't even jog outside without putting on a mask. So all these restrictions are important things to talk about. You don't have exercises. You have restricted movements, and we need to learn how to overcome these things to make our lives as near normal as we can. And then finally, I added the the, the story of the narrative of the career that we all have how many careers have been lost with this pandemic, many careers have been stalled, and many others have been threatened. And these are important things that we need to look at when we talk about careers because this has been a life-changing experience. Now, having said that, I've, I've, I've clearly defined what I think the impact story is. I want to now move on to talk about how to overcome these impact stories, as, as I said. And I've said before, uh, when I spoke to Elmi, that what we need to understand is that there are three important things in overcoming this pandemic. The first one is education. A deeper understanding of pandemics and, and, and how they play out is, is really, really a tool we all need. Because if you don't do that, if you don't have a thorough knowledge of this disease and how it plays out, you're only going to be sustained by rumors, misinformation, and all these things that come with it. And you cannot do that because anxiety, fear will run through your head. So we need to walk away and say, where can we find the information on how it infects people, how different it is from other viruses, where does its power lie, where does its strength lie, and what are its weaknesses and limitations? You need to understand that. That's the first thing. The second thing we need to do is there has to be an acceptance of change. There is really nothing we can do about this. This virus is here, it's like a war. And there was life before COVID and there will be life after COVID, but it will never be the same. So the sooner we make peace with this transition, the sooner we make peace with the inevitability of change at the end, the better for all of us. And finally, the most important thing for me is to never miss out on exploiting a crisis. Now remember, no crisis is without opportunities. Now, you look at this, many people have come up and said, you know what, we can't do stuff. We can teach online. We can work online. We can deliver food online. So many things have been sprouting all about that were otherwise I'd imagined uh, five, six months ago. This is what it means to explore the crisis. And so remembering those three things, we can now approach the impact and see how we can deal with it. Education, accepting the change, and exploiting the crisis. What, as far as I'm concerned, are the ways we can overcome the mental impact of this? Now, the biggest tool is a thorough understanding of the science behind the disease. And, and, and that way, there will be no fear, there will be no rumors, there will be no misinformation. Just a pragmatic engagement with the beast. Now, as soon as you start having mental issues, fear, anxiety, and depression, teach yourself to speak out. Find somebody you can speak to, your friends, join social groups where you can talk so that you can clearly elucidate the nature of the beast. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna be guided by horrible things, fear, misinformation, superstitions, and everything else that comes with it. Continue to learn about this virus because what we thought we knew about the virus three months ago 
has changed massively now. So where we used to think, you know, this virus is something you can get only by people spitting at you, we understand that it can stay airborne for three years. essentials and change your financial roadmap. If your car that you used to have is a lot more expensive, get rid of it. If it's a townhouse you lived in, you can't afford moving with your friends. But do not create a situation that puts you under more immense pressure mentally, physically, and financially. When you can actually just swallow your pride and walk away and say, you know what? This thing came. This thing happened. I am moving to my mother's house. I'm going to live half happily ever after that until things sort themselves out. Now, on your material side, when all else fails, remember there are government schemes to help you. Remember there are bank schemes to help you. My bank came to me the other day and said, listen, we understand there's going to be a problem. If you want to get a break for three months, we'll give you an overdraft. We'll make you do this. We'll make So there are always ways to get help, but you must make sure that you do not tie yourself in more knots with all these financial uh, situations that may come your way. Socially, you can't travel anymore. Now we understand the immense importance of hugs, of physical touch, of everything that we do as human beings to keep ourselves alive. But that is not gonna happen anymore. So we need to have a paradigm shift and say to ourselves, you know, we can utilize phones now. We can utilize computers. We can go on Facebook and we can hook up with relatives and things. And we've got to let go of the past and, the, and, and those things that, that uh, were important to us culturally, where you had to go to funerals to meet up with people. We're not gonna do that anymore because only 50 people can go to a funeral. You're not gonna go to weddings anymore because that has been outlawed. So people, I saw people getting married on Zoom the other day, you know, and that, that, that is happening. And, 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 and for me, uh, again, falling back on accepting the inevitability of change is paramount. So you're going to say to yourself, listen, uh, you know, this has happened. I won't see my aunt. I won't see my chummy. I won't see that. I'm not going to go to the funeral. Even people that you really, really care about when they die and have to be buried, you will not go. I had a husband who hadn't seen his wife for a month and she died and he could only go bury her after that. These are the difficulties we have to live with. Now, the physical aspect of this. Now, and remember, uh, physical exercise, physical existence is an important part of our well being. When you exercise, you release endorphins. And these endorphins are your well being, your mood elevating hormones. And if you don't exercise, all of a sudden your serotonin level kicks in. Now, when serotonin uh, levels go down, and your endorphins go down, you become depressed. So we need to understand that physical exercise is an important part of our lives. But if you can't go to the gym, if you can't run outside, is that the end of the world? Of course not. There's lots of indoor exercises you can do. The television has been really good at this. There's been program after program saying, look at us on the screen, do the exercises, do the stretches. And I think for those who wanted to, you know, the world has just been uh, available for them to do that utilize home exercises and do stretches. So on a physical level, there has been opportunities to overcome the barriers that have come with this. Now, finally, talking about careers, there's no doubt all over the place that our careers have been challenged. Mine, uh, and I'm sure Elmi's and everybody else's, we, we don't go to office anymore like we used to. I'm beginning to get to a stage where I can see patients uh, on face, uh, using FaceTime on my phone uh, because the risk is just becoming too much sometimes. Um, but what's happening as well is that a lot of companies are asking themselves very simple questions. You know, the virus came, people went home, nothing changed. Do I still need to have people in my office? Do I still need an office so big? 
And people are beginning to realize that, you know, some jobs are not really necessary because I can have somebody at home on the computer doing two of them and still have the same productivity. So it's changing the nature of how we look at ourselves as companies and how we look, we look at ourselves as employees and employers. Now, working from home has become the new uh, book. And you know, people are beginning to learn to, to not only um, uh, invest in this aspect of our new life, but to also make it as productive as going to work. Now, why would you want to work at home? It's great. You don't have to get up early. You don't have to drive in the traffic. You don't have to waste money on petrol. And all the benefits that come with that. You, know, you go to the office once or twice a week. But if it doesn't affect your bottom line, why go to work every day? These are important things. Now, where a career, an educational career, stalls, people need to understand that you must accept it. I mean, I had a guy who said to me, I'm going to lose five months. I can't afford it. You know what? You have to teach yourself to afford it. People have been through wars. I mean, the Second World War lasted, I don't know how long. People had five years of their lives wiped away. I know a guy who was in second year medical school when the Second War, uh, World War started. He tells me there was nothing he could do. So five years later, he went back to the medical school, started his second year again, and graduated. But you know, you have to make peace with the fact that at the end of it all, it could have been worse. You are alive, you are healthy, and you can restart your career. And I think understanding the limitations of this pandemic is a fundamental tool that we all need, but also making a paradigm shift to say, I have to make peace with the fact that my life has changed forever. And in doing so, I need to engage living, going on in a manner that is pandemic friendly, and that exposes the opportunities that I see within that. So with all that, I hope I've covered in a nutshell what I think are the important impact stories of this virus on us as people and how I think we can mitigate its impact in the different aspects or facets of our lives going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inky. It's really powerful for me to listen to you and I'm sure for our members as well. I'm going to open up for um, a session of question and answers. You can use the chat box at the bottom or the Q&A box and post your questions there um, related to this specific topic. Um, please don't ask Dr. Pitsway for personal medical advice <laughs> at this stage, but um, any question related to the topic, we can deal with that. Uh, yeah, we have, what a phenomenal session. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, any, anything that you would like to ask from Dr. Pitswe, uh, maybe advice on um, how to deal with a specific situation in response to COVID. Many of you have challenges in completing your studies. So you're welcome to ask us questions. It seems to me, Enki, that you've covered most of it comprehensively. Um, and I think people are still in awe when they looked at the video and then they realized who is <laughs> our host for this evening. Um, and we really appreciate that support. You said that your son is online. Yeah, Tuman is online. I saw him pop up. <laughs> Uh, raise your hand, Tulani. Yeah, Let's see. Cape yeah. From Cape Town, he's studying there. Town. He's a Golden Key member. I don't, I don't know. This is all is news to me. I didn't know he's a Golden Key member. <laughs> well, I he think um, yes. One that says I'm an industrial engineer, and I'm interested in how my skills could be applied with regard to PPE supply chains and logistical factors. Fantastic session. Thank you very much. Um, I think the industrial engineer should pop me a mail at southafricagoldenkey.org and we can take it from there. Um, anybody else? Well, with that, I think then we can close the session. If there are no, uh, Kirsten, such an inspirational story. Thank you, fantastic session. 
So Enki, it seems to me that you really cut through to the core. People are happy. They heard what you say. So mm -hmm. with that, I'm going to release you um, and say thank you very much for your time um, and the support and specifically mm -hmm. the support to Golden Key. Amina says, watching my first GKSA webinar, it was definitely a powerful one. Thank you, Dr. Enki. Um, thank you very much. And then thank you for the wonderful presentation. I just want to know from Dr. Enki how to motivate students to learn. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, Elmi, Elmi and, and I work for an institute, an educational institute in, in Rosenberg. And, and I think uh, we, we were there for almost 10 years trying to, to make a difference in the educational spaces over there. And what we what we realized is that um, and I sent Elmi uh, a thing of this, and I, and I want every one of you to Google this and read it. It's called the Emotional Keyboard. And the Emotional Keyboard is a very powerful tool that, that informs you how educating children raised in poverty or living in poverty is. And one of the things that we, we don't quite understand and accept is we think that they do not want to learn when in fact they're not able to learn they're not capable of learning now what the emotional keyboard teaches us is that all values that you learn in the first 15 years of your life stay with you forever so if you are a child who was born and you didn't have the luck of even the one parent or the one adult who can hold your hand it's always a very difficult task. And remember, in this country, out of every 100 African children who start grade out, 54 fail to get to high school. Of that 56 that get to high school, 10 of them pass metric. Of that 10 who pass metric, three graduate from university. These are the real numbers. Nobody wants to talk about it. But this is the real number story in this country. So out of a million matriculants who started grade R 12 years ago, only about 300,000 in this country right now. Angie Mutsera knows this. So how can we impact? Now, my story has always been, we need to go back to mother tongue education. Because if you don't have a language of cognition, you're not gonna be able to access information. You're not gonna be able to interrogate, interpret, and utilize information for your own wellness. And that's why children coming out of our high schools at the age of 15, 16, 17, read and write like 11 year olds. Because the school has made a difference. Because once you start your education at grade R with a four year lag and there's no intervention in between, you never catch up. So I feel for people who struggle and say, I'm trying to teach these kids, I'm trying to motivate them, misunderstanding that the, the psychological lag is something they can't do anything about and the poverty that held them back should have been sorted at early childhood spaces. Because if you do not have the interventions in your early childhood or your foundation phases, high school is a waste of time. You can't do anything. So the government pumping money into high schools when you've neglected early childhood and foundation phase education means they do not even understand. So I feel for all of us, and Elmi and, and I are in those uh, spaces in Rustenburg trying to solve these things. And I can tell you now, it's hard. Yes, I agree. Um, and it's not a, a quick fix. No, it's something that will take a long time. I have a person here asking, um, I know COVID-19 kills. I do want to be cautious, but how do I avoid being so fearful at times? I don't want to end up depressed because of it. Right. Now, remember what I said. The fundamental thing is to entool yourself. Make sure that you have an arsenal of information that allows you to deal with this in a very positive manner. Now, here's a story about the pandemic. In October of last year, 
there were clusters of pneumonia cases in China. And the Chinese at the time thought these were isolated pneumonia cases, but very soon they began to realize that there was a link. They initially thought it wasn't a person-to-person -person infection, but come December of last year, they began to realize that this was actually transmitted from person to person. So on the 31st of December, 2019, the Chinese government told the World Health Organization, we have a problem at that time. They had been with this thing for two months. And in that two months, people had been flying in and out, in and out of China to all over the world and taking this virus with them and without any restriction. That's why the Americans are upset. That's why we all upset that had the Chinese said earlier, there's a problem, they could have quarantined people earlier and saved us all this. But you know what? There's water under the bridge now. Now, having said that, what has been clearly understood is that you can only get infected through three spaces, your mouth, your nose, and your eyes. That's it. And the only way you can get this virus to get into those three spaces is through your fingers. And this is to simplify it. So if you keep your fingers away from the virus, if you keep your mouth, your nose, and your eyes away from the virus, you sort it. Is that an easy thing to do? I doubt it. It's complex. You've got to be on your toes all the time. Because you sometimes thinking, I've washed my hands, and you just wash your hands, somebody comes and grabs the door, the person is infected, you grab the door, you don't wash your hands, you say, I've just washed your hand, my hands, you touch yourself, you go. So if you have a mask on all the time, the mask does two things. It stops you from touching your face, which is a great thing. But the second thing it does is that if you are an H no, a COVID positive person, you cannot spread the virus onto the other person. Now for a long time, they used to say masks do not do the trick. But now information and studies have come out that if you wear a mask and I wear a mask, we can actually limit the spread of the disease because your mask will stop the flow, my mask will stop the flow. And in people that are not symptomatic. So if you remember the simplicity of it, the weakness, the limitations, it needs those three spaces. And the only way to get to those three spaces is through your fingers. But if you wash your hands every, every couple of hours, if you sanitize them as frequently as you can with alcohol, you will remove the virus from your fingers, you will therefore have nothing to take to those three spaces. It's as simple as that. Thank you. I think um, that's a very clear answer. Here's another one. A lot of pharmacies are stocked out of the flu vaccine with mm -hmm. senior medical students returning to the clinical platform. Should they not be vaccinated for influenza at least? So as to attenuate the severity of co-infection with COVID-19. Yeah, and, and remember the, the severity of, of, of co-infection suppose that you're going to get infected. Now, what I really want to say right from the start is that you should not get infected. Now, what's going to happen to us is that, remember, you get flu the same way you get COVID-19. So if you apply the universal protective measures I've just spoken about, you'll also keep the normal flu away. Because that's how you get flu. You get flu the same way you get COVID-19. Flu doesn't fly in the sky you get it from your fingers into your nose, into your mouth, into that. So if you use those universal protective measures, you are gonna do a double a hit with COVID and with that. But I agree, uh, you should get the flu shot if you can, but like any, any other thing that, that helps us deal with this virus. You know, this chem has run out of uh, sanitizers, you know, the bio team. So now they're making the lesser capable ones that uh, people are buying. So we, we have to make peace with the fact that washing our hands still remains the most important aspect of prevention. Social distancing away from people that you, you feel are, and then putting on masks and visors as part of your protection. And if everybody treats themselves, everybody treats themselves as if they were COVID positive, that will help a lot because then you say to me, how can I stop me from infecting the next person? But if you're thinking you're negative, that's when you're going to lex up and, and, and get caught up in this thing. You've got to wake up every morning and say, imagine I was positive. How can I save the next person? And if everyone did that, 
we will go a long way in making sure that this pandemic doesn't happen. Now, the other point I want to make Ellen, is that South Africans need to understand that all of almost all of us by the end of this year will be infected with the virus. So we're expecting 80% of South Africans by the end of this year to be COVID positive at some point. That's the nature of this pandemic. Now, when that happens, we call that a herd immunity stage, which means that we've all now been infected, we've all been immunized, we can't infect anymore. And then the people that are high risk can now move into society, and because there's herd immunity, they will not get infected. Now, when you flatten the curve, you extend this herd immunity stage even further, which is a, not a good thing, but it's something that must happen because we've always said we flatten this so that the hospitals can cope with the numbers. But we all accept that eventually, if you don't have 40 million South Africans infected by the end of the year, then something is not quite right. But this is where we're going. And when that happens, we're in good spaces, life can go on as normal. Another person asked your opinion about the process fogging. Um, is it an effective way to disinfect large factories and high touch areas? Um, you, I know, think yes. you know, I mean, I, yes. I, I've been talking about this to people and I, I spoke to my Chinese friends a couple of weeks back when we thought this thing was just, you know, a droplet spread and uh, standing me just saying, why are you spraying the air? I called him, I said, you know, I said, Luffy, why are you spraying the air? And she says, we think this thing is airborne. And I said, okay, if it's airborne, then we should know, you know, because you know something we don't. Now, a lot of what we do now is probably, and I speak, uh, you know, I know I throw myself under the bus for this, is probably fear mongering. I mean, remember, if it's in the air, it'll last probably, what, three hours, and then it's gone, and it won't survive. So they go into schools, that have never had anyone inside. And they spray the school flat out. And I keep asking them, what are you trying to solve? They're trying, we're trying to kill the virus. I said, from who? And people look at you. So there is a lot of fear that is driving things. And there is a lot of, but you know, if you know there were people there who are infected, that's a different story. But you know, people are doing this in spaces where, you know, somebody came to my house and says, can I fumigate your house today? I said, no, my house is fine. So these are the kind of stories that we have to deal with from a scientific perspective, not from a rumor mongering perspective, because it simply adds on to our mental health issues. Thank you. And there's another one that asks, there's a lot of stories that gone around that exercising with a mask on is actually a negative impact on your health. Is this true? And if it is, what can we do to ensure that we get the minimum negative impact while exercising with our masks on? I feel I'm on CPAP when I walk around I, with my mask. <laughs> well, I, I, I've walked with my mask, but I don't exercise with my mask because I have a, I have a treadmill that I use at home. I think, I think what people think happens is that the, when you exercise, your amount of oxygen usage goes up. And there is a feeling that the masks obstruct the flow of oxygen into your lungs, and therefore you get tired, you get more tired quicker. I don't know how true that is. I've never done it. Uh, I would have to ask uh, exercise physiologists how true this is. Uh, but I've seen people exercise with uh, nasal prongs that uh, for oxygen su 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 support, and they seem to be doing all right. But I truly do not understand. What I do know is that you can jog with a mask. You know, I've seen friends overseas job with masks and they've said to me, it's okay. How intensive your exercise is would obviously depend uh, on, on, on how impactful wearing a mask is on your exercising. Right. Um, I think we've exhausted you. No, so, I'm okay. If you have those questions, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, there are no further questions and comments, except for mm -hmm. thank you very much, powerful session. Um, people really enjoyed the session with you. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much again. Thank you for all pleasure. the time. And um, we hope to have another one in future. Uh, yeah, that would be great. I really, the next pandemic, really, the next pandemic yes. is in 100 years. 
No, no, we'll have something more positive <laughs> the next time. <laughs> and also not how to fall pregnant. We'll find something else. <laughs> All right. Thank have you very much. Evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Enki Petswe. Um, have pleasure. a good evening. Stay safe and thank you for your support. Have a good day. Yeah. Goodbye. With that, bye bye, everybody. We're going to end this webinar. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye.